Hello? Who's there? Uh, this, this is this is Posh Allen. I've been captured by the gatekeepers. No, they're going to transport me to their dungeons at the, at the first possible opportunity. Quick, you must get word to the newest knights of Alexandria. Get word to the newest greatcoats, Lisa and Terry of the Sordovic clan. Also, also, most recently joining our staff of nobles, we have Duchess Stephanie of the Richards family. And also three new knights perfect to free me from the gatekeeper's clutches. We have the great knight, Sir Klaus. In addition, the mysterious knight, Sir Edu of Hidalgo. And finally, the powerful knight, Sir Christine. Please, get them word as soon as possible. I must be freed. Hi guys, welcome back to the Library of Alexandria. And today guys, today I am going to talk about my top 10 book series of all time. So I just got back into reading really this year and so I haven't really finished a ton of new series. And so it's, and so much of this year has been reserved to like reading, really I've only finished like a handful of series. And so it's hard to really draw from that on what my favorite series are of just the year. So instead, I'm just gonna talk about my top 10 favorite series right now. And this goes all the way back from however long I've been reading to now, the, my top 10 series, and I'm gonna update this every year, maybe every half year and see kind of where it stands. Now, I've, uh, if you've seen my top five favorite authors video, you might be surprised about where some of these series stand. It's not gonna be just completely the order that you think it's going to be, but I am determining series really by um, one, completion. I haven't completed all of these, but I need to have, either kind of caught up to where they are or read a significant um, amount of them. Like Long Price Quartet, again, I is kind of like an honorable mention on this list because I really love the two books that I've read, but there are two more. And I don't really, two books really for me isn't enough to kind of gauge uh, if the series is an all-time favorite for me just yet. The same thing with Malice. I love Malice, uh, uh, the first book of The Faithful and the Fallen, but having not read the last three, I'm not really gonna, uh, it's, it's too early to put it there. Same thing with Mistborn. While I love The Final Empire, that first book, I really can't uh, say that it's a favorite series of mine just yet. So without wasting any more time, uh, I, I'm going to put these in order. They are in from 10, from 10 being the least best, all the way up to one being my absolute favorite series of all time currently. And let's get this, let's get it started. All right, so at the number 10 slot, I have The Demon War Saga by R.A. Salvatore. So I didn't want to pick a ton of things by uh, the same authors. So I tried to limit to one per author, and this was difficult because I used to consume R.A. Salvatore's books like there was no tomorrow. Like pretty much most of my library consisted of R.A. Salvatore books specifically, and then uh, Forgotten Realms books just uh, generally. And his Dritz books, of the Dritz books, my favorite are the, the Legacy, Starless Night, and Siege, Siege of Darkness, where they're, they're fighting in Menzo Baranzan. There's a ton of the, like, the house politics, which I love. Um, even better than that, though, I like his Cleric Quartet. But I think my favorite series of his is outside the Forgotten Realms, and it's the Demon War Saga, at least the first three books. So if you're not, if you're not familiar with the Demon War Saga, because I've never heard anyone anyone in the history of me ever speaking to anybody who has read these books besides me. So there's three books, The Demon Awakens, uh, The Demon Spirit, and then The Demon Apostle. And then there's a middle book called Mortalis, which kind of segues into a second trilogy in the same series, which is Ascendance, Transcendence, and what's that last book? Immortalis? Is that what it's called? Let me look. Yeah, it's, it's Immortalis. And I don't like that second series as much, and I really don't like Mortalis, the mid, that middle book. It's, it's kind of boring. But those first three books, I really, really enjoy. And if you've ever heard of this, this is really the, my first experience ever with kind of a hard magic system. Uh, before, you know, I'd ever even heard of Brandon Sanderson. This is back when I was, I was much younger. So these books are about uh, a demon. The enemy in the first one is the demon dactyl, and it comes out, and it comes out from this uh, volcano and causes all these, these, they're called, what are they called? 
powries, these little like, there's little dwarf things with, like red, blood red caps and they're like really hard to kill and there's goblins and there's powries. Ah, oh, I can't have thought about powries in ages. And then other, other just kind of monsters that, um, but in the first book, the demon dactyl is beaten and it turns into a spirit that kind of infests the church because this um, church, very similar to the Catholic church, is kind of the main, uh, it's in charge of really kind of the magic system in this world. And our hero is a guy named, uh, a kid named O'Brien who was kind of raised by the elves and no one ever, like the elves never raise anybody. So it's just this big thing. And he's taught like how to shoot bows. And it's, that's all pretty standard. And his childhood friend, Pony, who is, um, who is kind of like, uh, she, is kind of like trains with a monk. And then there's this centaur named Brad Warden and this other uh, friar who all join on this quest. Um, and the friar is kind of a, he is an exile from the church because the church is, as churches are in fantasy books, super sus, but they control the magic system. The magic system are these gemstones that rain down from the sky and they fall on this one island. And at one point in the first book, they go, they have to go and uh, kind of collect them um, because that's how the church gets more. And a bunch of people are killed in like the gem rain. But each of the gemstones has very specific powers that it can do and that's why it's, it's a hard magic system it's much more like item based like graphite um shoots lightning bolt like graphite with graphite stone you channel it and it shoots lightning um hematite's kind of like the soul stone you can kind of uh uh possess people with hematite or heal them as well what else is there? there's rubies like fire i think uh i can't remember what a ton of them do i know tiger's eye uh, allows you to kind of like get a uh turn like you can like see in the dark um or if you like pour deep deep into it, like your, your arm can turn into like a tiger paw type thing. And so each gemstone has its own power that you're trained to use. And I love this series because I, I love the magic system. I always have L. Brian's stupid. I don't care about L. L. Brian. I really like the monk in the first book. Um, Pony's okay, but I love the villains in this book. The kind of the, the father abbot who is just super like, just not a good person at all. But then my favorite is this bishop Marcolo de Onoro, who can literally, who just has tiger eye permanently and kind of can morph back and forth between uh, a tiger and just having a tiger arm. And this guy is one of the most evil bad guys that I've ever read. And he's so awesome and just so, and has such a cool name, de Onoro. Just freaking cool, kills a ton of people. I just love these books. I love these books for the magic system. I love these books for R.A. Salvatore, if you don't know, writes really uh, precise battle scenes. One of the things that's tiring about Salvatore books is that he really writes all of the fights, like every kind of move, like he really is a big fan of sword fighting and martial arts. Um, you get tired of that really quickly when Salvatore's all you read, but in small doses, it's really, really good. Anyway, talked way too long about the Demon War uh, saga, but I've never heard anybody talking about it. Um, anyway, after they beat, the demon just kind of gets involved in the church and it's just super, super good. So if you haven't checked that out, you definitely should check that out. At the number nine slot, I put The Shadow Campaigns by Django Wexler. So The Shadow Campaigns are flintlock fantasy at its finest. They are, it's essentially the Napoleonic Wars, but with magic and with demons. And the first book called The Thousand Names is this regiment of the army is given a new, a new colonel named Janus Valnich, who is I love Janus. I think it's supposed to be Janus. I'm not saying Janus. It's Janus. And he is that brilliant character who's, he's like, he's like Benedict Cumberbatch, Sherlock Holmes. He's, he's kind of a Sherlock Holmes kind of, kind of character as far as how, how far ahead he is of everything when he's thinking. But our main characters are Marcus and Winter. Marcus is an officer in the army and he's just like, he's your very standard good guy, honorable commander. Uh, there's all these people in the army who are just pieces of crap. He's very, he's not like Sharp. He's definitely more, more honorable than Sharp. But some of the guys uh, who are against him and, and just the douchebags in the military remind me very much of Sharp's enemies in the Sharp books. So we have Marcus and then we've got Winter who is arguably most people's favorite character in these books. Winter is a 
she is an orphan who has, she has mulan herself. She has decided to pretend to be a man to join the army. And she is, and she is a private uh, in, in this first book. And we see her kind of uh, involved in the thick of things. Uh, Marcus is her commanding officer. And then you have Janice who's commanding both of them. And so you get Marcus's perspective and Winter's perspective in the first book, and as it expands, it becomes much more political. Um, the church gets involved. Yet again, we have demons involved in the church. They're called the Penitent Damned. And then we get the perspective of kind of the princess of the country, and we get other uh, POVs as it just continues to get bigger and bigger. And these are based very heavily on the Napoleonic Wars. There are tons of cannon, tons of musket fire, rifle fire. The battle scenes are just so epic. Books three and four, which are, which are books three is, is this huge military campaign to take over this, um, this kind of fortress, which is really good. It's called Pride of Valor. And then book four takes place in the winter, Guns of, I almost, I almost said Guns of the Patriots. It's not Guns of the Patriots. That's Metal Gear 4. Uh, Guns of Empire. And it is the, this winter campaign is just so brutal and so compelling. Guns of Empire is one, it, it, it's my favorite book of that series by far. But the reason this series is so far down is that book five, The Infernal Battalion, does not stick the landing, in my opinion, in any way. It is rushed, something cool or potentially cool happens at the very end of book four and it is just not utilized to its fullest in book five. It's very disappointing. The way everything is resolved is just like, oh, are you kidding? You see it coming and you're like, no, no, there's no way he resolves it this way. No, no, it's not gonna, no, come on. And it just, it felt like the book shouldn't have been there. You add a hundred pages to each of the f previous four books and we'd have been fine. I did not like book five at all, by far the weakest of the series. And because it did not stick the landing, it is just down farther at number nine. However, the books leading up to that are great. If you like flintlock fantasy, uh, muskets and guns and the Napoleonic War kind of times and that kind of stuff and fantasy, you'll like the shadow campaigns. At number eight, I have a similar problem. We have the Poppy War series, and this could have been so much higher. You've heard me talk about the Poppy War before. I have a review for both the Poppy War and the Dragon Republic and part one of the history of the Poppy War uh, videos all on my channel. There is a uh, second part for, of the, the history coming in January as well as a review for the Burning God. So I love the Poppy War. This is about, uh, if you don't know this just in, in brief, it is we have an orphan named Rin who ends up enrolled in the top military academy in Nikan, which is really China and they are fighting in the Third Poppy War where the, the Muganese the Federation, which is the Japanese, attack them, and warfare ensues. This is hardcore, grimdark military fantasy. Uh, RF Kuang pulls no punches with how brutal and the cost of war and how terrible people have to be in war. Rin is exceedingly unlikable, and that doesn't make me dislike the books. Um, I still love the series. The first one was fantastic with its pacing. The second one even more so, because where the first one is more focused in the warfare, the second one is kind of like uh, countrywide warfare, and we get more of the secondary character characters and the magic is explained even more and it is just a thrill ride from beginning to end. We also see a lot more of, of the Hesperians which are kind of the the, the Britain analogy and uh, the, just just w watching condescending uh, colonialism is just exciting to watch and then we got to the Burning God and guys I did not like the Burning God. Um, I'll, you'll see in my review but I did not like it at all. I thought it suffered from <laughs> so many things. It was boring, in my opinion. It, it suffered from single POV. It just, it was complete missing of the mark from what I anticipated was going to be a uh, continuation of the Dragon Republic. In fact, ev almost every narrative choice made in The Burning God was one that I disagreed with. So, 
there are many people who love the burning god but i am not one of them i thought i was very disappointed by this third installment and because of that poppy war is further down at number eight instead of higher where it should be so at the number seven slot we have the malison book of the fallen by stephen erickson now the reason this is lower is one i have not finished it i am still trying to finish the crippled god this last book in the main 10 book series and the other part is i liked malison way more before i joined booktube booktube <laughs> it malazan is difficult because very much like like sanderson you are forced really i think on booktube to accept as objective truth that sanderson is a master of his craft and at that same by the same token you're also kind of forced to accept that erickson with everything he's trying to do is a genius and the problem is some people reject that, but there's no one who really just, eh, with Malazan. Either you hate it and you stop reading it, or Malazan is the single greatest work of fiction in the modern era. And there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of room for people who disagree with that. I haven't seen anyone really who really likes Malazan while at the same time, like not accepting this as objective truth. And that is where I lie. I really enjoy Malice and Book of the Fallen because I've read these books multiple times because I think a lot of the plot points are excellent. I think the I think some of the military stuff is the best some of the best I've read. The the Siege of Yigatan is one probably the best novella. It's just a chapter, but it's like 130 pages. So it's a novella. It's probably the best novella I've ever read. It's so fantastic. However, I don't, I don't agree. Like, I don't agree with a lot of the themes I'm supposed to see. And again, let me finish it. But I'm not sure that reading book 10 is going to be the, the panacea here. But some of the themes I hear repeated are from Erickson's mouth. And I'm like, I, I mean, yeah, that's what Erickson says it's about. And everyone else says that's also what it's about. But I'm like, I don't really see that, except maybe kind of. And this whole thing he's trying to do, I'm like, okay, yeah, I get what you're trying to do. That's boring. Like, to me, that's boring. Like, okay, I see that what, that's what you're trying to do, but I think that's boring. No, I don't understand why that happens. And I think that's okay. But that's where I stand with Malison. So while I love the series, because I, I don't like the first book, and I certainly don't like book eight. Yes, I don't like Toll the Hounds. It's boring. Sorry, guys. But I think some of the other, especially the Seven Cities, I think it's the Seven Cities campaigns and, and the Lether campaign that draws me in. I think the Ganabacus stuff is really where the series kind of fal falters for me. But uh, Dead House Gates and then the continuation in House of Chains and then the continuation in The Bone Hunters, but then Midnight Tides and parts of Reaper's Gale are just so freaking good. They're so good that I have read them multiple times in order to re-experience this kind of military drama at its finest. Um, there are so many characters, as you really need a ton of characters if you're going to write really big scale uh, military uh, drama. Otherwise, you're very, very localized with, with, uh, with points of view. And so I really do like it when we get that, that kind of bird's eye or multiple POVs of the battlefield. And so it is for this military stuff that I keep going back to the Malazan well. And so for those reasons, Malazan is at number seven and not higher. We'll see if it moves after I finish The Crippled God. At number six, I have Glenn Cook's The Black Company. So Glenn Cook is not one of my favorite authors, uh, or at least one of my top five favorite authors, if you've watched that video. But The Black Company series is really something special when taken as a whole. I don't think any, any particular section of it is very... Uh, indicative of the feeling that I have about the Black Company as a whole. But I've read this whole series three times and I'm on my I'm working on right now my kind of fourth read through of this. In high school, my me and my buddy Franklin, we read Black Company like it was our freaking job. And I remember us just desperately waiting for that 10th book, Soldiers Live, to come out that came out in the year 2000, the year I graduated. Uh, maybe the, 2001, maybe the year after I graduated. But we were just waiting on pins and needles to get our hands on Soldiers Live. Because this epic about this, this storied company and its 
exploits now that it's no longer the stuff of legend as they start in the north and then work their way kind of toward the south and you know from the beginning we have these larger than life sorceress characters involved but as, as things get bigger and bigger and the stakes get higher and higher and Cook's Black Company was really the first series before Game of Thrones before Malazan where Cook did not care about killing off characters and that was just a shock the body count in the black company series is ludicrously high everyone dies <laughs> like so many people die in this freaking series and it's just very uh pared down very gritty it just follows this company and the analysts as they document they're all in first person as they're documented by these company historians and you just get to know everyone through the analyst's eyes they are not all written by the same analyst and so each cook does a really good job varying the the authorial voice between each analyst so uh, Croker is the main analyst. Croker is the is the analyst for uh, for the majority of them. But then when we we see these other analysts, they speak in a very very different voice than does Croker. And so that is just the Black Company just has such a uh, a high seat in my mind from from when I was younger. That even though I wouldn't say Cook is really one of my favorite authors, because I don't think there's any one specific book that I look at. And I'm like, oh, this was freaking amazing. Other than Shadows Linger, which I really enjoyed. But I think the story of the company as a whole is something something that I will probably keep revisiting again and again. At number five, we have Bernard Cornwell's Sharp series. Now, I have not read all of Sharp's uh, series. There are 21 of them, I think, and I have read, I think, 10. So I've actually read fewer than half of the Sharp books. But they are historical fiction set in the Napoleonic Wars, and Richard Sharp is a scrappy young private who kind of works his way up and uh, through these and through his continued survival in these terrible battles. Now, the battles are always the backdrop and the set piece of what's going on, but Sharp always has some kind of like lesser mission going on, like uh, taking revenge for the death of, of a loved one or a friend or trying to, in Sharp's Tiger, trying to uh, rescue a British spy or trying to pretend to be traitor and sneak through and like recover something from the other side. And so Sharp always has this mission, but it's always during one of these great campaigns uh, of the British against Napoleon. Uh, Sir Arthur Wellesley, the Duke of Wellington, who eventually beats Napoleon, is just so, it's so cool to see this just like famous legendary historical figure brought to life in just kind of like, he feels very much like the patrician from Terry Pratchett where he's this, y you understand and he's a genius and yeah, but he, do, does he have to be that big of a douchebag? Like does he, is it, is it really necessary to be as douchey as he is? So he's c kind of an ally of Sharp, but not really, he really kind of doesn't like Sharp. <laughs> but so seeing all of that, it, it, Bernard Cornwell, as I said in my author video, I'm not gonna say too much more about it. He writes uh, military sieges, he writes warfare, uh, really like, like no one else I've seen. I'm, I'm hoping to get to his uh, Arthur series this year. I probably won't be able to get to his Saxon one until next year, but I wanna read more Sharp and more of Cornwell just in general. So my fourth favorite series in the number four slot is another one I haven't talked about here before, and this is The Asian Saga by James Clavell. James Clavell writes historical fiction like nobody I've ever seen. And the, the only reason he's not on my favorite authors list, uh, at least the top five, is because I enjoy the books of varying quality after the first two. Um, it starts with Shogun, and they're not all direct sequels. They just kind of they kind of follow the same uh, lineage of this trading house called the Noble House. And the first one is Shogun, set in uh, right at the at 1600 around the Battle of Sekigahara uh, with feudal Japan and the Warring States period of Japan. And then the next one takes place in the 1800s um, in British Hong Kong, and it's called Taipan, and it deals with uh, the, these two trading houses that are based on real trading houses in Hong Kong, and. These first two books, Shogun, uh, about uh, a British uh, naval captain who is stranded uh, in, in Japan and caught up in kind of the warring, the warring states period between uh, Iyasu Tokugawa and uh, Ishino Mitsunari as the, kind of the two main daimyo who are fighting. And then Taipan, they are very, very different. So it's always really hard for me to pick a favorite, but these are two of my favorite books of all time. 
James Clavell is such a fantastic writer to just keep your page turning and evoke that kind of all of this Japanese culture and history just laden in Shogun and just how exciting he can make this competition between trade houses in Taipan and Dirk Struen just being this this likable yet yet douchebag like ruffian versus Tyler Brock and and then Blackthorn and Toranaga in Shogun they're just so so good if you have not read if you are in any way interested in kind of Asian historical fiction Asian fiction just in general please pick up Shogun or Taipan they are both fantastic now Gai Jin is set in Japan um, in the 1800s, at kind of around the, the Meiji Restoration, and it is good as well. It is not in the same league as Taipan or Shogun, but is still really good. And Noble House, which was, the, I, think, I think, the first one he wrote, um, takes place in the 19th, 1900s, and it is also good, but not fantastic. And then Whirlwind is really boring. Um, <laughs> and so... They don't have a consistency as they go on, but those two books especially, Taipan and Shogun, easily, easily solidify Asian Saga as my number four slot here. So these last three you've definitely heard me talk about, and you're probably not going to be super surprised by them. Um, in the number three slot, I have the Books of Babel by Josiah Bancroft or the Senlin books. The only reason they are here instead of at number two is because... It is not finished. The Books of Babel ha are not done. I love Bancroft's uh, classic yet uh, yet breezy writing style. I love Thomas Senlin and his character. I love the female characters that are, are extremely prevalent in books two and three, especially as the series shifts to multi-POV. Um, Bancroft has just created this incredible, whimsical, yet dark, yet exciting world that I cannot wait to see how he ends in the fourth book coming out next year. Um, I, if the fourth book is as good as I think it's going to be, I think Senlin will easily uh, move up the ranks of favorite series of all time. In the number two slot, and the only reason it's in the number two over the Senlin series is because it is done, and I loved the way he stuck the landing. And this is, to no surprise, the Great Coat series by Sebastian de Castell. Uh, the amount of the text that is that that deals with justice and principle and idealism as uh they tell falcio in one of the books now is not the time for indignant idealism or something to that effect <laughs> where it's just like you know sometimes if you have principles it's very very difficult to exist in the real world which is not in fact principle senlin deals with the exact same thing but he is less of a um uh, less of a fighter than is Falcio in these books. I really loved all of these books. I know some people think that three was a miss. Uh, it wasn't for me. I know there's some people who agree with me, but the majority opinion seem to think that Saint's Blood is not as good as the other, the other four or the other three. Um, I disagree, and I really love Saint's Blood, if nothing than for th some of those scenes uh, as the book is wrapping up. Um, the Great Coat series just filled with like inspirational speeches, people fighting for justice, fighting for virtue, fighting for honor. So many twists and turns. Here comes the cavalry. Great characters. Great villains. I mean, there's no surprise. Like, De Castell is number two on my favorite authors list, so his series here is number two on my favorite books list. And finally, to no surprise to anybody, uh, that my absolute favorite series right now in uh, that, that I have read is uh, the City Watch Discworld books. I didn't want to say Discworld just as a whole. Um, if I had to pick, then yeah, Discworld as a whole. But if I was going to narrow it down, it would definitely be the City Watch books from Discworld. Captain Vimes and the City Watch just... I love mystery. I love Pratchett's writing, as you've heard me talk about ad nauseum. I love just the interaction between the different characters in the watch, each of them feeling like a, like a living, breathing, three-dimensional character. Um, the watch has some of my favorite characters in fiction. Vimes, Carrots. Carrot could be easily be this lame, boring, lawful good paladin type, and he is, but without the boring part. Angua, an incredibly strong and interesting uh, female guard. Cob uh, Nobby and Colin, who are less interesting, but hilarious together. Detritus, the dumb troll, who could also easily be boring. Cheery, the, 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 
<laughs> the Gil Grissom uh, of Discworld CSI. Um, it's just the City Watch books are just so good and so consistent in their quality. And the Guards books also are also dealing with these real world issues like racism and xenophobia and war and classism and human rights and, uh, and all of these other like really heavy topics that are covered through the lens of Sam Vimes and the others in the watch. And, and I, I just don't know if I'm ever gonna see, find a series that can elevate itself above Vimes and the City Watch. I have read the, the, the Watch books, at least the first three, Guards, Guards, Men at Arms, and Feet of Clay, more than I've read any other book back there on my shelf. And so for that reason, the City Watch Guards books of Discworld are at the number one of my favorite series of all time. So guys, that's all I have for you today. Um, in my top five authors video, a bunch of you left your top five favorite authors down there in the comments. I encourage you to do that again. What are some of your favorite series? If you want to go ahead and rank your top 10, drop it down there in the comments. I, I love seeing the series that speak to people um, in different ways than they speak to me. I love to see what you guys uh, like, what, what you, how you guys rank, because there's always like some common theme. You can always kind of look at someone's top 10 list and be like, oh, well, you know, this person really likes that kind of thing. If you look at mine, you'll see that I really like military fantasy. I really like characters that fight for idealism. And I really like things that kind of deal with, with Asia as well. And I think that's pretty evident from my my list. So go ahead and if you have a top 10 list, drop that top 10 list of your top favorite series down there in the comments. Um, thank you guys so much for watching. As always, information about my Patreon and my Discord are in the description. And I will see you guys next time.